me. I, I thought to kind of present a bit of a reflection of being involved in this area and I left the institution, so I'm glad I don't have to speak for the IMF, so somebody else will have to <laughs> definitely answer to Dimitri's questions. Um, I thought kind of to share with you, provide a bit of a reflection of being involved with this transparency business from the, since the very beginning in the IMF. So there's a little bit of the cover, I'll go fairly quickly. Of course, I have to start with the historical excursus with, you know, with Jacob organizing this. I cannot escape that, but I'll keep it very short. I want to go back a little bit on the definitions. Virtually every single presentation I use the word transparency. What do we actually mean? Do we agree on what that is? Uh, I don't think we've been as successful as we claim. Now, this room, there's a clear bias. We're all converted. We are all convinced we've been trying to implement these things. But there is another 80% of the world, perhaps, which is not represented in this room, and they're certainly not convinced of the struggle, going through the struggle. So let's bear that in mind. What does it matter should be obvious, so I'll go very quickly here. I want to go very quickly on the new transparency code uh, that the IMF has issued. Uh, I take some of you, most of you, I would assume, are familiar with that. Uh, addresses some of the issues, but again, in the end, uh, we're going to conclude with the classic, glass is full empty or, 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 or half empty or half full. Okay, let's start with this question. I just want to make a point here. I'm not going to go through all these things. But uh, Jacob's uh, uh, book, which I'm sure everybody has memorized before coming to LA, uh, it goes through these ebbs and ties. There are cycles. And Tim has also write, uh, written an equally interesting piece. So I think we should pause and go a little bit dig down in, in what is actually driving this. Why these things we call transparency and cantabi seems to be coming and going depending on the seasons. My, my concern is if we fast forward to the last decade, I can see these cycles. If you measure these in centuries and decades, it's okay. There is a historical perspective, cultural changes, mega changes. I've seen this moving in my 20 years of professional experience very quickly between being the flavor of the month and then disappearing, and then up again and disappearing again. And even a crisis of the magnitude that we've seen, and some may even argue we may not really be out of it yet, uh, doesn't seem to have made too much of a, of a, of a change. So, and one of the problem in my mind is that we may not have a good grip on how to measure success. When do we really declare that the country is transparent, is accountable? So again, I'm gonna go back to some of these things. Definition, I'm not going to read the definition, uh, just to kind of, again, for the benefit of all of you, uh, sti I'm still very attached to this one, uh, simply because I'm a junior economist. These were not only my supervisor, but two of my mentors. And I think sort of pretty much capture pretty much all of it. Then, of course, everybody has to write a paper on transparency. We all tend to come up with our own. So we kind of play with words. We add an aspect. We subtract an aspect. The word that I underlined is really the word information, which again, virtually all the speakers have. And so what, what we actually mean is, is this really necessarily a good thing? The one last definition I want to touch is, again, the one, actually Tim and I work together on this one. Uh, I kind of like it because it makes a bit of a quantum leap. It brings together this notion of fiscal risk, which again, has been mentioned by many of you. So I remain of the view that the lack of transparency, Gerda has used the word fog. If you don't really know where you are, again, whether you call it lack of transparency or something else, that's, that's risk number one. You don't really know whether your step, next step is gonna really put you in a safe place or gonna just push you over the cliff. So again, this is something that also brings together something Peter just mentioned. There is a sort of multi-dimensionality to all this. Now, we are talking to about accounting and reporting. But again, I'm glad Peter brought in the national disaster aspect, the environmental risk, and there are quite a list of things that we usually tend not to focus. In this paper and in the, in the new transparency code, we try to make a little bit that connection so that we can bring together this, again, sort of multidimensional view of transparency. Information. Again, we have to be a little bit careful here. 
I mean, disclosing information, I mean, there are school of thought that say it's all about disclosure. Okay, fair enough. But it may not be. And there's all, the old say, say, no, there's no better way to kind of, if you want to hide somebody, you can just put it in front of everybody. Nobody will find them. So you can actually overkill with information. And people will really be very difficult to actually understand. So information has to be vetted, has to be presented in a comprehensive, comprehensive way. And, and again, if you go through any budget documents in the world, they're not easy to read. They're actually quite complex, and so are financial statements. So I think we have to make an effort. And I'm not sure what they call the citizen's guide. Actually, they, they may be a, a, a bit too simple, if not simplistic. Governments are complex <coughs> animals, a lot of moving parts. It's by far the largest agent in any economy. It moves half of the GDP directly or indirectly. So it is complex. Should be simplified? Yes. But maybe simple? I'm not sure. So we have to really be careful. And there is also an absorption capacity here. There's only so much information we can absorb and process. So we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, now, again, this is my personal view. First of all, I'm not sure what we measure when we look at, in this area, transparency. What are we looking at? There's always the risk, and first of all, we may not have a good case empirically. So the economic literature hasn't really provided a strong empirical case, and that's why perhaps we've been struggling with this. Because first of all, we, are we getting the causality right? Is a country go from transparency to better outcomes, or is the other way around? We don't really know. Transparency measured in various indexes, we're gonna come back at this in a minute. It's again, it's a complex phenomenon which is linked to a lot of things, first of all, income. So all these indexes, they have a very high correlation, positive correlation with income. So again, it's just because I have more skilled uh, a labor force because I have better university or because there is a notion that I really want to be transparent. And I don't think we have a compelling case of this. The so-called empirical evidence econometrically is not that strong and puts us in a very, as economists, in a very awkward position where we try to make the case, again, not to people in this room, but when I had to travel places like in the Middle East and in Asia, so the answer is, what's the need of me? Is my GDP going to grow? Is my fiscal position going to improve? Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer. The literature hasn't provided that sort of answer, which will be very handy to have. So we did try, of course, at the fund, but again, the, not with mixed success. Uh, one aspect that really sort of concerns me, whether we got the incentives right, in all this conversation, we try to convince people that transparency in the end is a good thing. Uh, we tend to confuse this with things that have more of a negative connotation. So that the, 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 if I go to Saudi Arabia and I start discussing with the minister or the prince, you know, I hear there is corruption in this country, that's pretty much the end of the conversation. <laughs> so I think a transparency, unfortunately, it be, has become a little bit associated with this Connotation, negative connotation. So it's become not as popular. We've been selling these as almost a moral category. So that's why in certain parts of the world, we haven't gone that far. And again, it's been seen like an imposition, the usual, uh, you know, advanced countries, if not Anglo-Saxons, conspiracy to rule the world. Of course. But, you know, again, I'm in Saudi Arabia. I'm in, in, in Thailand after the crisis. I have to convince these places that transparency is the way to go. And again, if, I have to be careful how to communicate here. Uh, and the risk is that we've been a little bit too naive, perhaps, in this area. So there are various aspects to transparency, and, and that's something I learned, unfortunately, the hard way in having this awkward conversation in part of the world where this culture is not there yet. The other things also, when we look, again, these are famous from, I think, Donald Rumsfeld started all this, and it gets increasingly complicated. There are things that we know, things that we don't know, things we don't want to know, et cetera, et cetera. We have to understand exactly where our counterpart is in that conversation. Are they really trying to hide things, or are there really things that 
they don't know. They don't even know that they exist, but that they come back with the vengeance and affect really their balance sheets and so on and so forth. And one notion that I always saw, there are various layers of transparency, and that allows me to open the conversation. Again, I'm using Saudi Arabia, uh, not that I, I accuse in particularly Saudi Arabia, but there are countries in that category. I think government, whoever is in, in decision making, has an obligation to know what, where they are. And then that's again, it goes to the fog argument. If you don't really know where you are, that's the level of transparency that I don't really have. And, and it's true that the sunlight, as the famous quote from Judge Brandeis, is very popular, but then I guess that the antidote that came from Professor Held, you know, you know this is kind of sunburn. Again, you can really hide things by providing more information, which we mentioned just a few minutes ago. So again, these are things that we have to keep in mind, and perhaps we've been a little bit naive or purist in this conversation trying to push these arguments. Now, why now? That should be obvious. We have a bit of a crisis, which in the paper that I, and this actually comes from a paper that Tim, the, the fiscal illusion paper, government tends to disappear and government didn't know really where they went, that where they were at the beginning of the crisis. In the paper that I suggested as a background, we tried to decompose, and clearly the risks are all over the place. You see the fact that the macroeconomic risk, revenue collapsed. We didn't know exactly where a state enterprise or private partnership were in or out of the perimeters. We didn't know how to calculate arrears because most budget in the world are still on a cash basis, and so on and so forth. So, Accrual is the solution, perhaps. I like to think this is so, 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 uh, uh, it's necessary but not sufficient. If a country doesn't want to be transparent, doesn't want to be responsible, it's not going to work. The little bit of empirical evidence, the market seems to care. So again, there seems to be some positive correlation in terms of spread and in terms of the various indexes of transparencies and governance that we've all devised. And they also seem to have a bit of a long memory here. Now, let me just go very quickly here. I just want to give you visually the structure of the code. Those are not familiar with the code, I'm happy to spend more time perhaps on that uh, uh, after this session or over dinner, etc. So let me go very quickly on this. It's, it's a bit more kind of flashier and, and quantifies much more. So try to build, as I was saying before, the empirical evidence. And it tried to connect the dots by bringing together in the same assessment the accounting view of the world, if you will, with the economist view, with the leap into the risks. So it really tried to do all these things in a single document. It's been successful, it's not been successful. I mean, it's maybe too early to judge. Clearly addresses a lot of the problems that we've seen with the earlier edition of the code and the reforms. Somebody mentioned the ROSC, I think Dimitri mentioned that. The ROSC, if you go back and read them, and I had to do that, uh, Greece and all the others done between 99 and 2003, most countries went through the exercise, they sort of said the right things, but were kind of cryptic, kind of almost in between the line, and there was no sense of prioritization, there was no sense Watch it, this is a problem. It was more compliance oriented. This new instrument tried to quantify, tried to assign priority. PPP may be an issue in Portugal, as it was, but may not be an issue in another country. So we try to be a little bit more systematic in this. Uh, for the cases that we've done so far, what emerges, as I said, risk is still in its infancy. Again, countries are still kind of struggling with the notion, they're not making this, this the, the connecting the, the, the dots between transparency, the good accounting, the information, and the fact that this actually helps countries face risk. We are not trying to say the government should avoid risk, quite the contrary. I think the government has an obligation to take risk. The risk, risk pooling argument, the Arling theorem, etc. Just you have to know what you're getting into. And that's something countries still are struggling with. Let me now go through the somewhat long, I'll stay within the time, concluding remarks. Okay, is the glass half full, half empty? If you ask me, and again, it's my personal view, I think it's half empty. If I look back 20 years, 
codes, standards, reports, uh, a lot of crises. We have quite a few. Don't forget, with the Asian crisis, we have the collapse of the uh, uh, Soviet Union, uh, the Mexican crisis, the Argentinian crisis. We've always been in sort of in crisis mode somewhere in the world. Yet, we still have a minority of countries that have embraced accrual accounting, have produced balance sheet, and even fewer that are actually using the damn thing, if I can use that expression. It hasn't really made it. We've issued the GFS, you'd be surprised, the desk economists in the, in, in, in the IMF, Dimitris know that quite well, don't use the GFS. They don't understand the GFS. That's the reason why one department goes out and says, use the GFS, go Ipsos, goes across, the average economist doesn't understand. Coming back to that in a minute. So what are the good news? There are good news. Okay. So first of all, if I look back when I started in this area, we didn't have all these standards and codes. We didn't have all these <coughs> uh, various initiatives. And we had quite a few. Now this, in my mind, has helped brought together, and this is clearly this, 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 this conference, this green example. People from different strands looking at the same thing from different angles. I think we managed to reproduce the, the fragmentation, the silo mentality that we see in a lot of governments in the way we do business. So again, economists don't talk to accountants, accountants don't talk to statisticians, everybody doesn't like lawyers, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so, but no offense, no offense, of course, to lawyers in the room. I think we've come a long way. We're not there yet. But I think, again, there is a number of fora where I see people are actually, I, I was accused by my staff to be a tainted economist <laughs> because basically I kind of used to speak with accountants occasionally. So teams itself is a bit of a hybrid from an from IMF <laughs> sort of point of view. It really so it got into areas like contingent diabetes and PPPs. So again, this it's moved, but again, we haven't gone that far. So I think I go back to this idea. We haven't really spent enough time to understand what the incentives are, because there's been a massive effort from all the international institutions and clearly bodies like IFAC and all the others. And the piece that remains to be written, and I'm sure Jake will provide this, how do we manage to have central banks adopt IFRS and we left governments in this single entry cash, even after the history, as you go through the centuries. That's, in my mind, is something I, I don't know, and I'd like to understand why, and why we've been sort of so patronizing vis-a-vis -vis government, until so the sort of revolution came from, from, from down under, and caught everybody by surprise. I was a desk economist in New Zealand, when New Zealand were going through reform, and most of my colleagues were absolutely horrified, and the focus was on inflation targeting. Nobody was paying any attention to the introduction of accrual and balance sheet concept on that work and so on and so forth. Now, the other things I want to finish, there is also the one thing we tend to be impatient. We want to do things yesterday. It takes time. I mean, the complexity, Gera made the point and others. It takes time. Change within government is a complex enterprise. Somebody has been talking of leadership. There are, you need leaders and champions along the chain, wherever they're sitting. You need your low level, if I can use the expression, sort of bureaucracy, to basically leverage the old thing. You need clearly the political cover. You need people with the vision. And what you do, go back to, to, to success. The only thing that we can measure, measure is the announcement the passage of a law. How many countries have announced that they have adopted Ipsos? I don't really know whether they've actually adopted, adapted, completely changed. So again, when in my policy conversation with countries, sometimes I'm really puzzled. And between the announcement and the implementation, we're talking about years. So again, in my mind, I go back. I don't think I'm terribly satisfied the way things have, have been moving. So let me finish the classic economists in the 200. So I think there are a number of things, but we don't really have an independent auditor, so to speak. So exactly come out and say, yes, country is transparent, has adopted ISFAS, the balance sheet makes sense or not. So we have to kind of, kind of ad hocish way of looking at this. 
there is more emphasis on convergence, clearly. As I said, we're talking among ourselves more than was the case certainly 20 years ago, but there's still problem. So, you know, in this place, I have to be careful, I'm gonna stick my neck out. I think academia is a problem. In academia, the curriculum absolutely still follows asylum mentality. If you're an economist, you don't do accounting. If you're an accountant, you don't understand economics. If you're a political scientist, you don't understand math. This is a problem. One of the failures, if I can use that expression, has been creating the hybrid sort of political service policy administration, which is supposed to be in the intention to create a civil servant for the 21st century, somebody who understands economics, pretty much going back to Jake, uh, what the, the way he started the conference. You know, centuries ago, people were trained into bookkeeping and accounting and arts and music and all these things. Now they're not. So again, this is something I think academia can do more. Conferences like this can do, of course, more. But there are these silos have to be broken. And Dimitri said, if we did the fund, clear the fund, there's problems with across the partners. But so is the bank. World Bank, so is the government. Those that do the budget don't understand accounting. Those that prepare the budget don't know the budget is executed. And they, have not, they don't understand what the, audit, what the function of basic audit is. So I think there's quite a bit of work we have to look at this in a kind of 360. As I say, understand the incentive. We have to sell it. Again, we understand, we are sold. But we have to do, again, to try to go the extra mile to make sure that we bring people with different background. Again, we're lucky enough with Ian here in the wrong year, Bob, because he and Graham Scott, people with different background, they came together, boom. You had the New Zealand Revolution. Gerard pulled together a group of people with all different backgrounds. Boom, reforms happened. Took years. Those are stories that need to be told. So please, write again more extensively with more detail. Sorry, taking a little bit too much time. Wow. Thank you. Wow.